All right, so this week we are working with negative news. So this can often be a really difficult concept. Um, no one really likes the act of delivering bad news, but it is a really important skill to have. Um, super applicable for the year we're in, which seems to be the year of bad news. Ah, so like I said, it's never fun, but eventually you'll have to deliver some sort of bad news, so it's really important to learn how to do so effectively. I'm sure we've all gotten a message delivering bad news that really rubbed us the wrong way, or just you can tell when they're not composed well. So we're going to talk through some strategies um, and some advice for composing messages that have bad news. So your goals in delivering negative news, um, there are a few of these. So first, just explaining clearly and completely. So what the negative news is, um, laying it out for your receiver, telling them exactly what happened, um, giving them as much information as you're able to. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Uh, conveying empathy and sensitivity, showing that, you know, the way this impacts them, uh, you really feel for them. Projecting a professional image seems pretty obvious. Um, maintaining friendly relations, so making sure that this negative news isn't going to have a really strong negative impact on whatever professional relationship you have with this receiver. Being fair. <laughs> yeah, being fair. Um, so conveying in your message that this negative news has a distinct reason um, that you've kind of looked through options or whatever. We'll talk more about being fair later on. Uh, but these are your main goals in delivering negative news. This is how you want your message to be perceived by your receiver. Uh, so the textbook recommends in composing messages that contain negative news using that three by three writing process that we've talked about before. So just as a little refresher, um, the three by three writing process, the first phase is analyzing, anticipating, and adapting. So really breaking down who your audience is, what they want, how this message is going to be perceived by them, how it's going to affect them. Second phase is researching, organizing, and drafting. And the third phase is editing, proofreading, and evaluating. So breaking that down a little bit further within the context of negative news, in that first phase of analyzing, anticipating, and adapting, uh, you need to analyze the bad news and anticipate its effect on the audience. So what exactly is the bad news? What are the details of it? And how is it going to affect the receiver of this message? Um, you may have like a personal relationship with the person you're sending it to and you know that they appreciate bluntness. So you know that you can just kind of come right out and say the bad news. Um, you might need to be a little more careful depending on how your audience is going to read this message is really going to affect how you compose it, what tone you use, what strategies you employ in your writing. Uh, if the disappointment in the message will be mild, you can go ahead and announce the news directly. So if you can anticipate that the news is negative, but it's not earth shattering, uh, you can just come right out and announce it. Um, if the news is more personal, if you know that it's going to have some sort of really emotional effect or something on your receiver, you'll want to try some techniques to soften the blow, uh, which we'll talk about a little later on in this presentation. In this second phase of that 3 by 3 writing process, researching, organizing, and drafting, um, you'll gather information and brainstorm ideas. So pretty simple. Um, you'll gather information on the bad news. If it's more of an intricate situation, um, you'll want to make sure you have all the facts laid out as clearly as possible. So you have a good understanding of what happens and you can give your receiver um, a great understanding of what happened as well. So a good strategy um, in this phase for composing a message that contains negative news 
is listing all the re all of the reasons that explain the bad news. So everything that led up to this situation happening. Uh, if you have several of these reasons, so say you have more than like three, um, concentrate on the strong ones. So only present the really strong reasons to your receiver. Avoid presenting any weak reasons because usually that's what an audience is going to latch on to and it might create a more hostile or especially negative reaction to this bad news. Uh, in the last phase of that process, editing, proofreading, and evaluating, uh, in that phase, you'll read over your message to ensure that it says exactly what you intend. So you want to make sure when you're delivering negative news that your wording is concise without being gruff. Um, so you don't want to add too much fluff. You are delivering bad news. You don't want anyone to feel like you're being condescending. Um, but you don't want it so short that it just seems really rude and brutal. Um, so it's a delicate balance. And again, as always with proofreading and evaluating, it's a really good strategy to go ahead and read your message out loud and see how it kind of sounds more conversationally. If it sounds too gruff, it probably is, and you need to add some things to your message. Uh, readers are much more likely to accept negative messages when the tone is friendly and respectful. No one likes getting a message that's just really curt, um, that can just lead to frustration, sadness, and you want to make sure that your uh, message, even though it has bad news within it, that you're still maintaining a good working relationship with whoever is receiving this message. Uh, we're going to touch on this just really quick because it is pretty important, um, especially once you start composing these messages in a more formal professional context. So when composing negative new or er, yeah, when composing negative news, uh, you want to be careful to not incur legal liability. Um, the textbook lays this out in a little bit more detail, but we're going to run through it real fast. So uh, first thing you want to touch on when thinking about legal liability is abusive language. So that would be like calling someone a name, accusing them of something. Um, really, you can just kind of think of this as like some sort of negative confrontation between people. Uh, when abusive language is written, it's called libel, and when it's spoken, it's slander. Uh, to be actionable, abusive language must be, one, false, damaging to one's reputation, and published. So if there's some sort of negative news, you want to be really careful to keep any kind of name-calling or anything like that out of it. Um, second kind of facet of this is careless language. So like I mentioned in one of the previous slides, you want to be really careful that your negative news message says exactly what you intend. Um, you must be absolutely sure in delivering bad news that there's no sort of implicit or hidden message that someone can't read it incorrectly. So the textbook had that example um, of a factory where someone had been injured and just because someone had sent a message to someone earlier saying that they couldn't do tours of the factory because it would be dangerous, the factory lost a lawsuit against that person who had been injured just because someone had slipped the word dangerous into some like months old message. So you just have to be really careful about what sort of words you use, what kind of tone you're using. And the last one, um, I think this is probably the most important one to think about is the good guy syndrome. So make sure you don't send messages that are potentially legally dangerous just to make yourself or the receiver feel better or maintain good relations. So it's really easy to fall into this when you're delivering negative news, um, to be really complimentary, to really try to soften the blow and kind of just go too far with that. No one really likes being the bad guy and delivering negative news. Um, in the textbook, there's that example of someone who sent a rejected job candidate a letter that said, even though you were by far the most qualified candidate we interviewed, we had to give someone else the position. And they ended up getting in trouble because the rejected candidate um, sued for discrimination because she was told that she was the most qualified, but she wasn't hired. So it's just a really slippery slope. 
um, when you try to make your negative news too kind, uh, when you try a little too hard to kind of soften the blow or maintain those good relations. So it's all a delicate balance, and we're going to talk through some strategies to hopefully avoid um, those mistakes. So we've talked about this a little bit before, um, but now we're going to talk about it within the context of negative news. So this direct versus indirect strategy when composing messages. So you'll use direct when, um, meaning that you'll come right out and deliver the bad news, like immediately within your message, uh, when the bad news is not damaging. So if the bad news um, is kind of insignificant, so say you work for a company and you're increasing the price of a service by just a few dollars, you can go ahead and come right out and say that. That's not devastating news or anything like that. Uh, you can use direct when the receiver may kind of overlook the bad news. Good example of this might be when companies like change their terms and conditions, those really long things. Um, people aren't likely to really be up in arms about something like that or even necessarily really look at it in any detail. You can use direct when the organization or receiver prefers directness. So if you have... Um, a really solid working relationship with an individual or organization and you know that they just prefer for you to come right out and say stuff or say they're really busy and they don't need any sort of fluff um, and that is really contextual so you'd want to make sure that you're positive that that individual or that organization does prefer receiving messages that way um, the last one, when firmness is necessary. So if something really detrimental has happened, um, like a breach of information, um, I think the textbook uses the example of a security breach, um, so potential for identity theft, when people really absolutely need to know the bad news right away so they can start proactively um, finding solutions and doing what they need to do to solve whatever problem has occurred, you can go ahead and come out and say the bad news. Or also if you have sent a lot of messages, so uh, like an example would be collection letters. If you've sent um, a few notices before and haven't received any response, uh, you can just be really direct at that point. Uh, you can use indirect, so kind of cushioning the bad news um when the news is personally upsetting so if you know that there's going to be a really strong personal reaction to the bad news say it's something like laying off an employee um rejecting a job candidate or a school applicant or something like that um you can kind of put an introduction so the bad news is cushioned a little bit softens the blow um you can use indirect when the news will provoke a hostile reaction. So if you think the recipient might kind of lash out against this news, uh, when the news threatens the customer relationship, or when the bad news is unexpected. So some critics of the indirect strategy would say that um, it's unethical to not just go ahead and come right out and... Um, deliver whatever news th that is the point of the message. Um, but that's not exactly true. When you're using indirect, you're not trying to deceive the reader or hide the news. Um, you're just trying to be as compassionate as possible. So make sure if you ever use indirect, you're using it um, with that sense of compassion. You're really trying to lessen the negativity of the message for your recipient. Make sure you're not using indirect in order to sort of hide the news um, or make it less clear. So I'm sorry this picture is a little bit blurry, but it's from the textbook. Um, it's just kind of a nice visual of how you would employ direct and indirect strategy. So if you're using direct, you could lay out your message like this. So bad news, announced here right away, reasons for the bad news, and a pleasant close. But if you're using indirect, if you need to soften the blow a little bit, first you'd use some sort of buffer, which we'll talk about some strategies for that next. Um, reasons for the bad news, the actual bad news itself, 
and a pleasant close. So opening with a buffer, if you do need to use that indirect strategy, um, here are some good ideas for how you might want to open that message. So starting with the best news. Um, so this is kind of a you have good news and bad news situation um, and you're delivering the good news first. This isn't always applicable to every situation. Um, it would usually be if there's some sort of really complex situation, but you could tell them a positive aspect of this situation before you deliver the negative aspect. Uh, open with a sort of compliment. So you'd see this a lot in letters, you know, rejecting job applicants or something like that. Um, praise the receiver's accomplishments, organization, or efforts, just to let them know that you still value them as a customer, candidate, person, professional, um, whatever they may be in this situation. Uh, open with appreciation. Convey thanks for doing business, sending something, uh, showing confidence in your organization, or even something like providing feedback. Another strategy would be agreement. So make a relevant statement with which both sender and receiver can agree. Uh, facts, provide objective information that introduces the bad news. This might be a good strategy to kind of offer some context for why this bad situation is occurring. Um, understanding, uh, just showing that you care about the reader. Uh, this is a really good strategy for customers and trying to maintain that good customer company relationship. Um, another big uh, aspect of delivering bad news is apologizing, which seems pretty obvious, um, but I'm sure we've all seen companies or public figures issue some really appalling or just really poorly constructed apologies. Um, so the textbook offers this concept called the five R's um, for kind of building a really effective, sincere apology. So first is recognition. So acknowledging the specific offense. Responsibility. Accept personal responsibility uh, for your actions, for the organization's actions. I'm sure we've all heard someone say something like, I'm sorry if people were offended. And that always just rubs people the wrong way. So you really just need to pinpoint exactly what happened, pin responsibility on yourself, or if you're acting as a representative of your company or organization, pin the responsibility on that company or organization. Restitution. So explain exactly how you're going to fix this issue, what actions are going to be taken to rectify this situation. Remorse. Embrace, I apologize, and I am sorry. Feels a little elementary school, but again, I'm sure we've all seen people who could definitely use this lesson, so it's an important thing to kind of keep in the back of your mind. And repeating. So say it won't happen again and mean it. Make sure that those actions you're going to take in restitution are actually going to result in positive change. Another important aspect of composing um, messages that deliver negative news is showing empathy. So that just means um, the ability to understand and enter into the feelings of your receiver. So showing them that you value them, um, you comprehend that this is a difficult situation for them, um, or it's a difficult thing to hear or read. So the textbook had some good examples of messages um, that convey empathy. Um, so an example, a message that's laying off employees. So you might write something that says, uh, it is with great regret that we must take this step. Rest assured that I will be more than happy to write letters of recommendation for anyone who asks. So that's kind of offering to do them a favor. Um, showing that you still value their skills and you believe that they're going to move on to something um, positive. Uh, in writing to an unhappy customer, we did not intentionally delay the shipment and we sincerely regret the disappointment and frustration you must have suffered. In showing genuine feelings, 
Uh, you have every right to be disappointed. I am truly sorry that. So really in conveying empathy, you want to just acknowledge what your receiver is feeling um, and show that you still value them. You still value whatever working relationship you may have. Um, so you want to make sure that when you're laying out bad news that you're presenting the reasons. Readers really want to know why um, a bad situation is occurring, why they're receiving this negative news, especially if it's really directly affecting them. So some strategies for this is just explaining clearly. If the reasons aren't confidential or they won't create liability, go ahead and be as specific as possible. People really appreciate that. Uh, citing reader or other benefits, if possible. Um, readers are more open to bad news if it in some way benefits them. So the textbook had that example of a clothing company um, who had to deny a customer's request for hemming a skirt. Um, but they responded by saying, no, we can't do that because it would increase the price and we want to make sure that our prices are kept at a certain point for our customers. So it's still delivering that kind of negative me message and saying, no, we can't do that, um, but explaining their reasons and showing that their reason is actually because they care about their customers and they want to provide their services at an affordable rate. Uh, explaining company policy. So gently explaining policy and why it makes sense. So you want to make sure you don't just hide behind company policy um, by saying things like that's just the way it is. Uh, you want to make sure you give the receiver the specific reasons for why that policy is actually in place. Uh, choosing positive words. You want to make sure you stay away from words like cannot, error, failure, fault, impossible. Um, mistaken, misunderstand, never, regret, unwilling, unfortunately, violate. Even though these messages have negative news, you want them to have a sort of positive orientation. Uh, and showing fairness and serious intent. So show the reader that you take the matter seriously, have investigated carefully, and are making an unbiased decision. So really laying out how a situation came to be, um, maybe laying out possible solutions you tried that didn't work, um, just showing that you have really thought this situation through, um, that whatever negative situation is occurring is kind of the last resort. Um, so if you're using the indirect strategy, um, or maybe even the direct strategy in some cases, you might want to try cushioning the bad news. So it's not always great to just come right out and be really blunt with bad news. And there are some strategies to kind of make it a little softer, more palatable. So first would be positioning the bad news strategically. Um, so you could put it in between two pieces of more positive news or two more positive phrases like compliments. Um, you can use the passive voice. So I know we've talked about this before that you should try to avoid this. And this is one of the only times that using the passive voice is okay. So doing that would just kind of take the action off of you. Um, so say you had to deliver a message like we don't give cash refunds. It might sound a little more nice to say something like cash refunds are not given because and then explain the company policy just kind of takes the spotlight off of you just enough um, to just kind of cushion the blow of the bad news a little bit more. Um, highlighting the positive, implying the refusal. Um, so sometimes it's not really possible to avoid a direct statement of refusal. Um, and your reasons and your explanations leave no doubt that a request has been denied. Um, but explicit refusals can just be really brutal sometimes. So just like straight up saying, no, we can't do that. Um, so 
laying out um, that you might want to work with someone in the future, um, that, you know, something is in your way right now that you can't help someone with something, but maybe later on, once you're completed with that task or you don't have that obligation, you can do business with them, um, things like that. Uh, the textbook has a few really good examples of that. Um, last one, suggesting a compromise or alternative. So this isn't necessarily applicable to every situation, but if there's some other option that you have available to your recipient, um, you can try including that to cushion the bad news. Last thing you want to work on um, when composing messages with negative news is closing pleasantly. So you can try a few different things for this. First one might be a forward look. So anticipate future relations or business. This could tie in well to that idea of implying refusal. Um, alternative follow-up. So again, kind of in the vein, same vein of suggesting a compromise or alternative. If some sort of alternative exists and with follow-through advice, um, good wishes pretty obvious, um, just saying that you hope they move on to great things. Um, this will be used a lot in kind of rejection letters. Uh, freebies, if you're able to offer them. The textbook has that example of someone complaining about a meal, and in the company's response, they offer a coupon. Uh, and resale or sales promotion. So these work in messages where the bad news isn't really damaging. Um, say you work for a company that's raising the price of something a little bit, if the bad news isn't really devastating or huge, um, it is appropriate to close the message with some sort of promotion, but be careful that you're sure that that's going to work in the context you're writing in. Um, that could really backfire if used in certain situations. Um, don't invite further correspondence in these emails or in these messages, excuse me. Um, so don't say things like, if you have any questions, don't hesitate. You want to just deliver the news, lay it on the table, um, and don't refer to the bad news. You've already delivered it. You want this closing to just be pleasant and final. So just kind of a recap um, of delivering bad news sensitively, your options for a buffer, um, presenting the reasons, um, placing the bad news and closing. So this might be a good slide to go back to, to just kind of remember these concepts quickly. Next up, um, I'd like you to post to the week eight discussion board there. I've posted an example of, um, <clears throat> UWM delivering bad news. Um, we're going to analyze that message a little bit, see what it does well as far as using these strategies, how it might be improved. Um, once you've posted that, read the prompt for the week eight negative news assignment, and then complete the assignment and turn it into Canvas. Of course, as always, if you have any questions about these assignments, feel free to reach out to me. Um, or if you need anything else, I know we're coming kind of to midterm time. Um, and things are really stressful. If you need any assistance with deadlines or um, just really anything at all that I can help you with, please don't hesitate to reach out. Have a great week. Uh, I'll be in touch.